evening. We're going to go ahead and get started at 7 o'clock. My name is Laura Ponsky, and I am an adult services librarian here. I've also been partnering with Jennifer Miller, who is on the Environmental Affairs Advisory Board for the city. And we've been presenting monthly programs on the environment. This is really have three more programs to go. Um, we started this back in January. If you missed any of the programs, uh, they are on the cable TV uh, website. So you can go to the Avon Lake Cable TV website and look and see which ones you missed. And uh, if you want to register for future programs, you can go to the Avon Lake Library website, which is alpl.org. Go to programs, and then you'll be able to see what's coming up for October, November, and December. So tonight, we have a talk on birds, and um, Rob Swindell from the Black River Audubon Society is going to be talking about birds tonight, especially how they relate to um, the environment and what we can do to conserve them. He's also going to be talking about how light pollution affects them and uh, lots of other interesting facts and information about birds. So, uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Again, thank you everybody um, for coming and for the library for having us. And as she said, my name is Rob Swindell. Um, over here is Gina Swindell. She is my wife, and she's also the secretary for Black River Audubon. And she's got, well, one, she'll help me out on occasion. She's always got some stuff, stuff to add. And two, um, she's got um, some tote bags that we're going to hand away during the presentation. So we might have some quick questions for uh, a chance to win a tote bag. Just a little bit about um, Black River Audubon. We've been around since 1958. So we've been around, we're celebrating our 65th year as an organization. Um, we are a membership organization. There's a local chapter, which is us, and then of course there's National Audubon. And we're dedicated to protecting the environment through conservation, education, and advocacy. And that's actually our, um, our formation letter back in 1958. We were originally named the Elyria Audubon Club, and we serve Lorraine County and Medina County. Uh, or into Medina. We follow the Black River into Medina. As I mentioned, we have three primary areas of focus. We have education, conservation, and advocacy. Education, we have monthly speakers um, nine times a year on the first Tuesday. We have monthly field trips, which is a great chance to get out and see birds and learn about birds. Audubon Adventures is a educational program for grades three through five that we uh, partner with some schools, well, through Elyria mostly. We offer scholarships to Audubon Camp for teens and adults, and then we have an outstanding speaker where we bring in a national speaker each spring. Our conservation efforts, we'll get into a little more of this in the presentation, um, but we work with, um, our, we're best well known for our Bluebird program, but we also work with Purple Martins. We've worked with Kestrels in the past. We have a small park, we contribute to a prairie, and then we try to participate in citizen science with the bird count and MODIS. And we'll talk about those later too. And then the third part of what we do is advocacy. Um, we try to make people aware and uh, educate about things like single-use plastic, climate change, uh, cats, window strikes. And again, we'll talk about some of those tonight. So birds are amazing, and watching them is fun. So I'd like to start off with just a little bit of background about birds themselves. There's about 10,000 species. You can see 700 of them in North America. We're treated where we live in the Lorraine County to migration, particularly warbler migration each May, which is really popular and brings people from all over the world, um, especially over into Ottawa. But also in the fall too here, so for anyone who doesn't know a lot about birds, <clears throat> right now there's a lot of these warblers coming back through heading south, but they look a lot different. They're super drab. And so if you really want to challenge yourself, right now is the time because it's really, really hard to tell what they are in the spring. It's much easier. So yeah, a good place here is Cough. Cough has some and um, there's the Sheffield Lake bike path. Lots of warblers are being seen over there. And also another odd place, which I hope is still there after they do their new plan. But um, where does uh, Chad go, Rob? What's that street over there? Avalon. Avalon? Avondale. 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 Yeah. Avondale is a great place to see. There's a residence retail that hangs out over there. and. Um, and lots of warblers over there too. And then one of my favorite parts about birds um, is they're, um, they all have kind of an ecological and evolutionary story to tell and how they've survived. Um, this is just one example. Uh, that's a cowbird being fed by a cardinal. 
um, cowbirds are brood parasites and they put their eggs into the nest of other birds and so sometimes you see strange stuff like this like a cardinal feeding a cowbird and again um, this became a very popular hobby uh, during the pandemic because people were looking for a chance to get outside and then they come in all shapes sizes and colors uh, one of my favorites that I can't hope to see one day is the harpy eagle I think that's as scary as any Halloween costume I've ever seen but second might be the shoebill stork but then again, we also have our beautiful birds, the painted bunting, the uh, hummingbirds. So we have um, a number of birding hotspots in Lorain County. And our first bag that we're going to give away today is for the person who guessed which hotspot has the most species in Lorain County. So some of the choices are Lorain Impound, Sandy Ridge Reservation. Sandy Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> Oberlin Reservation. I mean, uh, the Wellington Reservation. Okay. Somebody had to, so if the man's a raise their hand, because I got to give up price. It's going to be the first time doing this kind of way, so we don't know. Actually, it's the Lorraine Impound. There's been, and the fishing pier in Lorraine, they have, they've seen over 285, or they've seen 285 species there, according to eBird. But Sandy Ridge is second. They're close behind. They, of course, have the nice, diverse habitats, bald eagle nest. Margaret. Peak Nature Preserve is actually kind of a hidden gem in North Eaton. Uh, it's a grassland habitat. They've had over 200 species. And then there's Willington, Vermilion, and Illyria. As I mentioned, we have our field trips. They're scheduled the third Saturday of every month. We hit those Lorraine County uh, hotspots, but we also hit locations in Medina, Cuyahoga, and Ottawa counties. And that picture on the right is um, a recent trip to Margaret Peak. And then we also do out-of-state field trips. Uh, we've gone to um, Saxon Bog in Minnesota. This will be our third year. And next year we're hoping to go to southeast Arizona and we hope to get to Costa Rica too. Yeah, so the ones that are once a month around here, those are free, anybody's welcome. But the bigger ones, of course, are not. That's like three day trips. So but all that stuff's on our website. And we also have field uh, guides up here or guides up here that will tell you all of our field trips where and when. So then on the field trips we wanna try to identify the birds. And this is just kind of for fun, what people think they've seen and what they've actually seen. So for the second bag, is they, this is one of my favorite birds. They may know what this bird is. Is it a blue bird? It's close. It's a Colorado version of a blue jay. Yep. So who said blue jay? Is that one of these I'm supposed to be giving something out for? Okay. Who said blue jay? Because it's, it's close. It's a jay. <laughs> it's, it's a Stellar's jay. So about bird identification, we can do, and, and lots of people do, a whole presentations dedicated to bird identification. There's programs on gulls, warblers, raptors, because there's so much involved. But those are some of the basic categories we're looking at. What type of bird is it? The size and shape. We can tell a lot by its behavior. Its color, obviously, but usually color isn't the first thing we look for. What season we're seeing in, in um, whether it's migrating through. We can tell if we see a bird that the chipping sparrow and tree sparrow look very similar, but if we see it in the summer, it's probably a chipping sparrow. If we see it in the winter, it's probably a tree sparrow. And then here's a list of um, field marks in this picture, because you'll hear things like, um, look for the yellow lures in the sparrow. Uh, we can also tell a lot by their song, especially some people are really good at that, identifying the birds by their songs. And then of course their location, habitat, whether you find them on the water or in the uh, grasslands. So here's just example charts that we can use. The one on the left is for shorebirds. And you can see how detailed it gets with bill length and shape, the forging, forging behavior, the size of the bird itself. And then the warblers are always fun. I like this sheet here. Even though it's a little uh, simplistic, it could still be very helpful. There's some warblers that are different enough that, like the Wilsons, it's got that little tiny cap right there pretty easy to identify. When I was younger, I used to collect football helmets. They used to come out of the gumball machines. So I think it'd be really cool if we could turn these into gumball warblers. You can see somebody run home, I got a Nashville warbler, I got a Nashville warbler. And then here's a couple of the formal resources. Uh, Birds of Ohio, there's a ton of field guides for every situation, every place, every continent. Some of them are set up really simple. Some of them, again, are really detailed. And then there's a Merlin app. Um, I don't know if, we, if you're all familiar with that. It's an app on your phone that you can use to help identify the birds. And you could do it by either taking a picture of the bird and asking Merlin to help identify it, or by um, recording the song and asking Merlin to help you identify it. I use it a lot. It's really cool. So, yeah, if anybody doesn't know about Merlin, just come see me afterwards and I'll tell you all about it. It's pretty awesome. <laughs>
I'm the one of the things like to just kind of a joking fashion talk to talk about the difference between birding and bird watching. I kind of regard bird watching as a little more casual, kind of put your feet up with um, a cup of coffee, watching the bird feeders, minimal investment, maybe have a binocular or field guide. While as birding could be a lot more active, um, people chase rarities at a moment's notice. About uh, a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you heard, but there was a couple pink flamingos that showed up in Ohio, three and a half hours away. And people stopped what they were doing, hopped in their car, and drove three and a half hours to try to see the bird. So I would definitely call them birders. Uh, traveling the world to see birds, which is fun. It's like we, we like to do. We like to go to Florida, Colorado, um, anywhere we can go with to find the birds themselves. But birding can be expensive. Of course, there's travel costs. And then cameras, lenses, lenses, binoculars, scopes. Those all go from a couple hundred up to ridiculous. So. And the birders often like to keep records of what they've seen, whether they've seen it in a certain place or whether they've seen it um, in total. Yeah, and if any of you want to do that, we've got these yellow car cards up here. That's a list for Lorraine County. So that'll, that has all the birds that you can see here um, at some point during the year. Uh, so just those are free. So if you want to pick one up. And then this photo is on the right is um, uh, some folks in Costa Rica. Uh, doing some bird watching and they got a nice scope trying to see something high up in the uh, rainforest. And I also like to talk about birding ethics a little bit, especially for people who chase birds. I mean, of course, we want to respect and promote the birds and their environment. We want to make sure that we don't expose them to any danger. Uh, most of these are common sense, but the biggest complaints that we get are people getting too close to birds, making them uncomfortable. If you get so close that they fly away, you probably got too close. And um, people getting on private property. So every once in a while, some of you'll see a really rare bird on private property, and then everybody rushes over there, and you have to make sure that the landowner is okay with that. So conservation, this is a couple quotes I really like. Really, in the beginning, it's just about caring. If we don't care about the birds, if we don't care about the environment, we're not gonna work to conserve it. And then especially when it comes to conservation, if we can accomplish that in our lifetimes, we're definitely not thinking big enough because this is a problem that's gonna follow us, follow our species for as, as long as we live as long as it exists, I should say. So why care about birds? Birds are great ecological indicators. For a few reasons, they're resilient, they respond to changes in predictable manners, and they're easy to compile data. The nice thing about birds is that they're in the sky, they're in the trees, you can hear them singing, and it's easy to keep track of them, it's easy to count them and see if they're increasing or decreasing. Compared to if somebody said, go in your backyard and count all the mice that you have running around, that'd be a little more difficult. We also care about habitat quality, uh, we know when birds start having troubles, that there's trouble with the, the habitats, pollutions, and pesticides. We saw that um, back with Rachel Carter, um, Carson and Silent Spring uh, many decades ago about the impact that pesticides can have on birds. The biodiversity, when we start losing species, particularly in a, sp a special area, or a certain area, we need to worry about the birds. Uh, sometimes the birds will let us know about outbreaks We'll see certain flus or diseases that show up in the birds first before they move on to other species or even humans. And then of course I like to say everything in nature is connected and that's kind of why we care about birds because as we go, the birds kind of go. That picture on the right is a picture of the passenger pigeon. Of course we had three billion of those many years ago um, and they were hunted, uh, primarily hunted into extinction, which is amazing to think about. So that's why they need us. So why care about birds? Um, birds are good for the economy. This is particularly important when we're talking to uh, legislators, elected officials. They want to know what the birds bring to the community, what they bring to the economy. Bird watches can generate up to $100 million in economic activity. Again, some of the things we talked about before, travel, hotels, equipment, and there's 45 million people who participate in watching birds. And this is one of the scenes from McGee Marsh. Again, one of the most popular places in the world to see warblers. You can see that they are, the people are stacked three or four deep trying to get a good look at a bird. So the event in McGee Marsh is known as the biggest week in birding. This year it was May 5th through 14th. It's always usually about 10 days, that second week of May. And again, they really promote the idea and they've done studies about how much they uh, contribute to the, the um, economy. And uh, how many have been out there for McGee Marsh? A few? Yeah, and you'll see they really cater to the bird watchers. You'll see signs on the road telling you where to go or what's going on. Yeah, and if, if ever you do want to go to McGee Marsh, we do do a field trip there in the spring. Um, so watch the, you know, the pamphlets and this, the emails they send out. And at least then you'll be with somebody who can 
and to get you through the crowds. <laughs> it's a little nuts out there. And they've done a really good job of marketing themselves as the warbler capital of the world. And if you've been there and you go to, and you walk through the parking lot, you'll see license plates from everywhere. And the event has not only just sightseeing for the birds, um, they have workshops, field trips, they have lots of vendors. Um, it's really just a celebration of birding for 10 days. And it goes not only to McGee Marsh, they, there's also Howard Marsh, there's also uh, Ottawa. So if you go out in that area for that week, there's lots of places to go, because McGee Marsh can get kind of crowded sometimes. Howard Marsh is a really great example too of conservation because it was just a farm field for, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure how long, many, many, many years. And then they don't, the family donated that to the uh, Toledo Metro Parks and then they have restored it back to its natural habitat of a wetland. And uh, we've had things there like the King Rail spread out there. Now we have, for the third year in a row out there, there's uh, black necked stilts that are uh, breeding. So just putting it back to its natural habitat has brought back birds that we don't ever see. We hadn't seen one here in I don't know, who knows how long. So it's a really great um, story, Howard Marsh. And the event is so big that they even have a birding fo forecast on their, their nightly news for that week, which I think is just kind of funny. We care about birds too because they've been shown to support our health and our mental health. They can help decrease stress. We had a program last this month on Oren therapy. The speaker had written a book, Holly Merker, about this phenomenon. There's been lots of good research lately, the positive association between not just seeing a bird but also hearing a bird. Taking that few minute break to get away from society, to get out in nature, and just relax and enjoy the birds. And of course, they provide a way for us to connect to that nature. If you go out looking for birds, you're gonna also see deer and rabbits and all kinds of other things that are, are fun to see. Another reason to care about birds, studies have shown that it can increase your property value. Homes and areas that have lots of trees and flowers, like this one here, they say it can increase your value by $32,000, which seems high, but that's what they say. Another reason you can care about birds is that they benefit your beverages. They do this, well, they work together with coffee, and you've probably heard of shade-grown coffee, which they're practicing in a lot of places like Costa Rica, where they are using the natural habitat to grow their coffee, and that protects a lot of the species that live there. And then the birds that do their part because they eat a lot of the harmful insects that could uh, damage their crops. So it's a good relationship. So when we look at conservation, I think this is kind of the biggest issue to think about. Birds have been around for 60 to, million, 60 to 100 million years ago, depending on the science, whereas modern man has evolved over just over 300,000 years ago. And then if you look into, into the time that modern man has really had an impact on the ecology of this planet, you're really only looking about 400 years. So it's been, the birds are here, they have evolved, they were adapted to their ecosystems, they were able to identify predators, find places to live, set up migration, and then humans came and kind of changed everything. And here are some ideas. Why do we need conservation? And this is a list of human impact on birds. Of course, we have the habitat destruction, resource destruction by taking away their food and water. We have the different kinds of pollution, window collisions, automobile collisions, airplane collisions. Again, things that birds 50 million years ago never had to worry about. Insecticides, pesticides, rodenticides. Hunting, as we saw with the passenger pigeon, can lead to extinction in some areas. We also see that some hunters that use lead bullets and they might shoot a deer, but not be able to recover the deer. The, um, a bald eagle or another raptor might come and eat the, the deer, and then um, they get the lead poisoning. Climate change is again affecting the movement of the birds and the resources available. Human disasters, of course, we've seen the, the awful sights of oil spills and what they've done to birds at times. Wars is one thing I don't think we think about enough. Um, Open, Oppenheimer was a really popular movie this, this spring, but of course the atomic bombs not only killed hundreds of thousands of civilians, they killed everything that tried to live in that area, including birds and animals and insects. Birds are also affected by uh, non-native plants, non-native wildlife. Again, these are things that they aren't evolutionarily prepared for. Windmills, farmers. Uh, farmers work hard to protect the food they're trying to grow the illegal animal trade, feathers for high fashion. This was really a big issue um, about a century ago. We lost lots of shorebirds due to uh, people killing them for their feathers. And then of course we lay out lots of hazards that they might run into, such as fishing lines or nets. 
So the recent study, this is what we've, we're looking at. We're looking at loss of 2.9 billion birds since 1970, and that's a net loss, so that's above replacement or below replacement. And most of these are 12 bird families, including the warblers, the finches, and sparrows. That's another quote I like. It's from the study author, that we have the resources to do something about this. It's just a matter of us making the effort to do something and setting aside the resources. And this is a short um, video put out by 3 billion birds about what's behind the declines. Birds are part of our lives. They fill the air with song, inspire us with their beauty, and make their homes in the most unexpected places. Sometimes they're even our neighbors. But the birds we love are vanishing. An alarming new study reveals that the population of North American birds has dropped nearly 30% since 1970. That's almost three billion birds gone, vanished from our forests, grasslands, and backyards in less than the span of a human lifetime. Some of the hardest hit are familiar birds, orioles, meadowlarks, swallows, warblers. What's driving this decline? Birds are losing the habitats they need, places to live, find food, rest, and raise their young. They face many other threats as well, from free-roaming cats and collisions with glass to toxic pesticides and insect declines. Climate change will compound all of these problems and accelerate the loss of habitats birds need. This enormous loss of birds signals a broader crisis in the natural world, one that ultimately affects us all. But it's not too late. Our actions on behalf of birds make a positive difference and benefit the entire planet. Thanks to strong conservation efforts and habitat management, many waterfowl and formerly endangered species are now flourishing. It's time to expand these conservation efforts to help the rest of our birds recover too. With our help, they can be restored as a vital part of the American landscape and a precious part of our lives. We're united in pursuing better protections and increased support for birds. And you can help. Please join us. That's a really good website with some really good information. Three billion birds, and that's where these graphs come from. So of those three billion birds we've lost, 2.5 billion of them are migratory birds, including, as they mentioned, some of our favorites like orioles and warblers. A really key factor is stopover locations. So when birds are migrating, they not only need their summer home and their winter home, they need places to stop along the way uh, to refuel and um, prepare for the rest of their trip. And I kind of compare it to uh, taking a trip across the country. You need to be able to stop up and fill up your car with gas, stay at a hotel, and then drive some more. So the birds have to go through the same thing. Yeah, so the, is, it, is everyone familiar with the Lorraine Impound? Do people know what that is? Does anyone not know what that is? Okay, so yeah, we lived in Lorraine for 15 years before I ever knew that it was like three minute miles away from our house. So where the lo mile long pier is, uh, down there behind uh, Spitzer Marina, well now it's not Spitzer anymore, it's Oasis Marina, but the marina down there. So when you pull down there and there's the long mile on pier to the right is the, uh, is the Lorraine Impound. So that's what, when people say Lorraine Impound, that's what they're talking about. And so they dredged that uh, last year and that created a mud flat in that area. And man, there's been just unbelievable birds stopping over there because that, that's what they do. They're just, they kind of stop over. And so it has just been a, an, an accidental, because it wasn't anything that was done on purpose by them, they're just dredging the, you know, the, the river for the, the boats and ships to get through there. And um, yeah, so that's where that is, in case you ever want to pop over there. There's lots of them. We had a white pelican there last year and this year, American white pelican that stopped by. Okay, can anybody identify this bird for the last uh, tote? Did you 
Close. Part that name's right. If you read closer, you'll see the answer, but. <laughs> Somebody's got to say it first. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what, you ready? <laughs> but, well, how about since we have two, we'll give you for taking a chance, since he said he didn't have another question. And then we'll give the one who read it. <laughs> what is that? What is the bird? It's a black pole warbler. It's one of the most well-known uh, migratory birds because of how far it makes the mi its migration, over 12,000 miles. And you can see it comes from up in Alaska. This is the trip home. So it's leaving up here where it's living during the uh, spring and raising their young. And then they're flying to the coast here. And these are the stopover locations that are really important. They stop here, they get full, uh, full um, re-energized, and then they make the trip, the final leg, over the water uh, to get to where they spend their winters. And then there's a thing called BirdCast, um, which will tell you what it looks like um, in terms of bird migration. They use um, weather radar uh, to determine it. This is from 2017. But you can see that a lot of the birds were migrating uh, through the central US at this time. And birders use this all the time. They look and see what uh, looks good. If you're up here, there's low or none migration. Maybe you stay home today. Another underrated bird are aerial insectivores. We count on them to eat all the insects that bother us during the spring, summer. And just one example, a wren can bring up to 500 spiders and caterpillars, so it's nestling during a single afternoon. Oh my gosh. Lakeview is also another place to see some cool birds, especially during migration. Let's go over to Lakeview Park. Um, on the south side and both on the north side, there's just trees. That's where I saw my last black pole warbler actually was on the, the lake side. But um, the other thing I got to see there was um, on the south side, uh, near a, there was a bunch of the golden crowned, um, uh, I'm losing my words today. You guys know. The little birds, the little Kinglet. golden crowns and the red crown. Um, Kinglet. Kinglets, thank you, yes, kinglets. So there was a golden crown kinglet there, and uh, I, I saw him, he was in the ground, and he had something, and I looked, and it was a spider that was big, it was wrapped all, the body was bigger than his face, the legs were wrapped all the way around him, and he ate that whole thing. I just was, I felt a little bad for the spider, but, but I was just amazed that this bird that's about this big had this spider pretty much covering his whole face, and he ate every bit of it. It was just amazing. So they do. They eat all the stuff that a lot of us don't want to deal with. Yeah. And the same token, we'll see uh, birds like the purple martin um, who rely on the insects. And sometimes we get bad weather that uh, gets rid of the insects, and then they have a hard time finding food. So, And then the grassland birds, again, they're kind of an unsung bird species. Um, like the meadowlark, people seem to gravitate to the raptors, to the warblers, but these are very important birds, and we've been losing these birds at a higher percentage than the other birds, and mostly because we keep losing native prairies. So we said one of the biggest issues for birds is habitat loss, um, and for in fact, Steve Irwin thinks it's the biggest issue for birds. Obviously, they need their habitats, as we talked about, their spring habitats, their summer, their uh, stopover places, and their winter habitats. So what is happening with the habitats? Most of it's human development, agriculture, urbanization, deforestation, pollution. And again, they need quality habitats that has the resources they need to raise their children or their young in spring or to have the resources to survive over the winter. And it's not just always making sure that the land is available. It needs to be, uh, it can't be degraded or fragmented. A lot of times we'll see developers, they want to just leave little areas here and there for birds or for nature, but um, they usually need bigger areas to um, support the bio biodiversity. And when you do have smaller areas, there's increased competition for resources, um, animals spread into other habitats. You might get a predator that moves into um, an area where a bird isn't used to seeing that predator. And then what can we do? We can do more climate change research and I know we're trying to do that. Uh, keep working on habitat restoration and conservation. And then again, it's critical to have international coordination because it doesn't do any good if we do conservation here if the birds leave here and then have no place to go. One of the biggest issues for birds, especially locally, can be collisions with buildings uh, due to lights. There's a program called Lights Out Cleveland. They work with buildings in the city predominantly to ask them to turn their lights off. And what happens is the lights can cause um, confusion for the birds. They become disoriented. Sometimes if there's a light on, they get confused. They'll just drive in a circle. 
until they drop from exhaustion. Yeah, I was just say, if anyone doesn't know what Lights Out Cleveland is and you want to know more about it, um, they are always looking for volunteers. You, you gotta like to get up early in the morning. They go down to Cleveland uh, during migration. I think they get there around five in the morning and uh, they spend a few hours and they go around and collect all the birds that have collided. Some of them were able to be uh, saved, some are alive still, many of them are not, but the ones that are not, uh, they give them to the Cleveland Museum of History and then they, re you know, they study the birds just to see uh, you know, how well they, they were living or what problems they might have had. So it's a really great program and they're always looking for volunteers. So just search Lights Out Cleveland and then you, know, you can get more information on that. And you can see that um, the windows from collisions are second only behind cats in terms of what kills the most birds. Um, I was happy to see this. Uh, the arch in St. Louis will, be not, will not be lit up during uh, migration this September. So the word is getting around. There are a number of buildings and companies that are participating, but we are, there's also a lot more to go. So here's how you can help with light pollution. Again, during migration, they call it September 6th, October 6th. That's a good time period for most of the migrating songbirds and warblers. Um, if you could turn the lights off, turn the lights off. You could put motion sensor lights in. Uh, you can use the warmer tone light bulbs rather than the bright light bulbs that attract the birds. Well, I'll have to wait you're done. But the other thing too, which I don't know if you know about this, and maybe it's not there, I don't see it, but because I work in lighting, that's what I do is sell lighting. So there's something for outdoor lights called um, night, they're called night sky. So basically the light does not shine up, it only shines, shines out and down. So that's another thing you could do too, is get night sky outdoor lights. Yep, and then here's some of the solutions we're looking towards for buildings. Uh, turn off decorative lighting, substitute strobe lighting, whatever possible. If somebody's working late in the office, uh, close the window and use um, target, target lighting. We also see too that if you just turn the lights off or if they turn the lights off for 20 minutes, it gives the birds that are caught up in that cycle a chance to kind of reorient themselves. They can leave and then they can turn the lights back on if they need to. And I got one more video. This one um, is about climate change in a way it's affecting birds. Throughout our history, we've looked to birds as messengers. They tell us when seasons are changing. They tell us stories that help us understand our own. And they welcome every morning with their beautiful songs. Now they have an urgent message about our changing world. Scientists from the National Audubon Society have analyzed the observations of thousands of bird watchers and information from leading climate scientists, and they've reached a clear conclusion. Birds are on the move in response to global warming. Gary Langham, chief scientist at Audubon, says the message is stark and clear. It's an urgent message. Nearly half of the bird species in the United States and Canada are seriously threatened by climate change. And if nothing is done to abate this threat, many of the bird species we love could disappear forever. Every bird species is uniquely adapted to its surroundings, including temperature, precipitation, and changing seasons. But when rising greenhouse gases change the climate, the conditions on which birds depend are thrown into disarray. Birds will find themselves displaced from their homes. Many of the birds that will be threatened include some of our most familiar and beloved species. The bald eagle, the brown pelican, the burrowing owl, the common loon, the Baltimore oriole, and the Allen's hummingbird. The survival of these birds is in question. Being a bird is really hard. Each bird species is finely tuned to a set of environmental conditions so that everything about its physiology, its behavior, and its genetics allows it to be successful in that environment. But when those fundamentals of the environment begin to shift, it can be a catastrophe for birds like the Allen's hummingbird. Today, it breeds along the Pacific coast in California and Oregon. If global warming intensifies, however, its range will shrink dramatically by the year 2050, and even more drastically by 2080, when 93% of its breeding range could be gone. The birds may be forced to look for habitat in unfamiliar places far from the coast, where they will face new competition for limited food and resources and they might find new predators or fierce competitors that make it impossible to survive in new locations. It's a serious message that we've been given, from birds and from science, but there are also answers on how we can help. The broader question is, what can we do about it? The Audubon Report tells us two things that we need to do right now. 
The first is to reduce carbon pollution that causes global warming. And the second is to protect those places that the birds need today and will need in the future. We know that when we give nature half a chance, it is resilient. We know which birds to focus on and where they need our help. There is a role for all of us to play in making sure the worst effects of global warming don't come to pass. The important thing is to take action. There's something everyone can do in their individual lives and in their communities to make it a better place for birds and for people. Join us at audubon.org slash climate to learn more and take action today. Okay, and then another area that we uh, just mentioned is cats, the impact domestic cats have on birds. I think a lot of people, you know, you see a cat get a bird, it's all, well, it's just one bird, but collectively we're looking at over billions of birds a year that they're um, killing. And this is kind of a neat little study. They put a GPS tractor on three different cats in the area, and you can see how far they roam on these city, city blocks and how much they're getting into looking for birds or other animals to eat. And then some of the solutions for um, cats, obviously, and I always feel bad, but keep the cats indoors is one way to protect the birds. Um, they, some people could put up a fence, escape proof. They have catios, which is just an outdoor feeding area, freestanding area for the birds. The, um, Harnesses, I've seen this a couple times, and that looks kind of weird to me. I'm used to seeing cats in harnesses. Um, we can try to en enrich their indoor so that they have enough stimulation and get as much as they can out of life while staying inside. And then you can also put visual audio alerts on the cats to some degree of a success. Um, you could put things that alert birds that cats are close, either through visual or sound. Another big area of concern is plastic pollution. Single-use plastics are the biggest problem. Um, they break down into smaller pieces of plastic which then get ingested into the birds. Lots of seabirds in particular, when they open them up you can see all types of plastic that they've eaten or tried to feed their young. This goose we saw and it practically broke my heart. We saw him at the Lorraine Impound one day. He could still fly. He probably survived for a while, but again, I'm sure everybody's heard they should cut these up so that they don't actually end up on the neck of an animal. And then we try to do, um, Black River Audubon, we try to do plastic cleanups um, along the beach, and that can help. The one we did last year, we collected 220 pounds, I think, of garbage. Yeah, it was a ton. Yeah, there was so much garbage over there. That was at Lakeside Landing, which is over by the, that little beach by the, um, by the Mile Long Pier and by the impound. Yeah, and we're doing that one again. Uh, September, and again, we have a goal of 200 pounds of plastic. So that's all kind of the, the bad news. This is some of the things that we're trying to do. As I mentioned, our Bluebird program, all the different counties are here. You can see our folks in Lorraine County are doing a really good job with the fledgings of black uh, bluebirds. We have over 455 boxes in Lorraine County that are monitored by 50 volunteers. And then not only do you get bluebirds in these boxes, you get all kinds of other birds, like tree swallows and wrens and chickadees never house sparrows. We've worked with kestrels. We haven't been working with them as much recently. Those are the ones in the top two. And then the bottom two are um, Purple Martins. We do some work there with Lakeview Park over in Mill Hollow. And then we have some private residents who do a good job with the Purple Martins. And if you've ever seen a Purple Martin migration, it's really fun. I brought this slide because this year they were over at the Lorraine, Lorraine Impound. So they'll come, they'll stage for a few days before they make their trip down south. But when you get a whole bunch of them together, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, they were estimating what a couple hundred thousand they thought were there. It was about maybe like four or five days they were roosting there. And, oh, and also we have, um, they did a documentary on Purple Martins, um, some, some folks in I think South Carolina. It's called Purple Haze, and we'll be showing that this year in February. So we're looking forward to that. And these are some of our other um, projects. We have uh, up in the right-hand corner, there's Black River Audubon Park. Before I was here, but that's the mayor out there helping us plant trees. We contribute to um, wildlife rescue. We help fund four different rescue organizations who do rehab. We're getting ready to put up a Chimney Swift Tower in Black River Audubon Park. And there's one at the Overland Prairie too, to help the Chimney Swifts. Another thing we're doing very close to home is putting up a modus tower. These modus towers, they kind of replaced banding. Well, I shouldn't say replaced because we, we still do banding, but they're advanced technology. They put tiny transmitters on birds, and when the birds fly by these towers, it pings off the tower and lets us know what bird went where and when. We banded birds a lot of times. We didn't know what happened to them until they passed away. But this is a, a really exciting uh, system that we're getting ready to put in, and we're getting ready to put it in really close right here at the A1 Lake Library. Modus, um, it's really, really cool because it, uh, everybody can see it. If you go to, I don't exactly know what the website is, but just look up the Modus um, 
and that's not an acronym for anything. That, I forget what the modus means, but it, it means something in a different language. But um, anyway, uh, they, it'll cover like a five mile radius either way. So when this gets put up here, hopefully in the next couple months, we've got all the equipment, it's going in here on the roof. Uh, and then we're talking uh, to the Lorraine Library, Lorraine Library also, to hopefully get one up there, hopefully next year maybe. So we have a busy meeting with them this week. So that way that would cover the gap from there to here and, he, and there to Vermilion, because there's one out, or not through Vermilion, there's one out in Sandusky, I think. Yeah, so we're just trying to fill some of the gaps along the river. And, and what the idea for MODIS is, is to, they kind of make like different layers. So the first layer is along the lake. Then once they get all the gaps filled, then they'll go back another 15 or 20 miles, however many miles they decide. They'll go back and then they'll start another fence, they call it, you know, across the state. And then that way they can keep tracking where these birds go. But real quick, a, a, fa a cool story is I, I was in Costa Rica last year and um, uh, the guide that was with us has one of these towers at his home and he got a little notification on his phone that a bird flew over so he looked it up real quick and it was a bird that had been uh, banded and the transmitter put on it by somebody up in Maine and it was a friend of one of the people that was on the trip with us. So he hurried up and texted her and said, hey, your bird just flew over. So yeah, this bird was tagged up in Maine and we're down in Costa Rica and it just flew right over his house. So just, I hate these folks. It was just the coolest thing. I think I had tears in my eyes when I was talking about it because it, like, it happened right while I was there. Just to know that that tiny little bird made it all the way there. So it was so cool. Yeah, it's so really neat. And anybody can see it too. You can see what's flying over the Lorraine Impound or around this area. Once we get this tower up, you'll be able to look it up and see how these birds are doing. Yep, it's the first one in Lorraine County. It's going to be here. Yep. And then hopefully next year, or maybe next year, we'll do a presentation about what we find out, what kind of birds go through here. Just a couple minutes left. Modus again is part of the citizen science. Maybe you've heard of the Christmas bird count where we go out. Everybody across the country goes out and counts the birds and contributes what they've seen. Again, trying to get a good count of the birds and where they're at and how they're doing. And then we do the same thing in spring with the great backyard bird count. So as the one gentleman said, there's just a few simple actions that we can do to help birds make the windows safer. As we talk, keep the gats indoors, reduce pesticides, drink shade-grown coffee, protect our planet from plastics, and help with citizen science. When they talked about a conservation talk, I knew it was going to be kind of a down and depressive. <laughs> we usually try to have a little bit more fun. So I wanted to add just a couple of conservation successes here at the end. So it's not all bad news. Uh, the woodpeckers have been doing better. The raptors have been doing a lot better, particularly bald eagles. And then the waterfowl, thanks to preservation of wetlands, have been doing a lot better. Again, Black River Audubon, if you want to get involved, we're on Facebook. We send out emails a couple times a month, and then we're, uh, we have wingtips and stuff for our membership. Thank you very much. And I don't know if we have time for questions or not. I've read quite a bit pros and cons about uh, backyard bird feeding helping to increase the, popu the populations. And I've also heard that some belief that it also is negative and it impacts, negatively impacts because people don't do it all year or they only do it for certain seasons. Yeah, there's mixed opinions about that. I know um, the scientists we had in our program in May I think he told me once that even with all the bird feeders, the birds get like 90% of their food from wild sources. So you're really just kind of helping the birds out. I don't think that you're really harming them as long as you're keeping the feeders clean and not passing any diseases or um, issues. No, I'm saying that's exactly it, right? Just keeping them clean because that's the harm is when people don't keep them clean. And I know in particular the winter birds, when there's lots of snow on the ground, the chickadees, the uh, titmouse and stuff, they really appreciate uh, the seed and stuff. But in the spring, a lot, when the birds start having their babies, a lot of the babies eat protein sources, so they eat insects. So the birds might stop and feed for themselves, but they're not taking the seeds back to the, the, fledge, the, the young babies. Um, they're usually going to catch insects and give those to them. How do you feel about the wind turbine issue? You know, you... You yeah, hear that, well, the birds will get through anyway. Yeah. It's a really good question, and it's another issue that not even all the experts agree upon. Um, we've asked Lorraine County, you may have seen that they are looking into windmills and solar panels, and all we've asked is to be a part of the conversation um, to make sure they're not putting them in high migration areas. There's been some compromises proposed, like turning them off at night, what to use in different colored blades or lights. So it's, it's hard because we support renewable energy, and of course, that fights climate change at the same time we don't want windmills uh, hitting birds either so it's really just kind of looking at it as a individual basis why 
Do birds usually migrate at night as opposed to daytime? Yeah, many of the warblers and songbirds migrate at night. There are some, like hummingbirds, that migrate during the day, but a big percentage migrate at night. The reason is the uh, predators that hawks, raptors, they see the birds. They're bird eaters. They Makes get them. Sense. So okay. at night, uh, they okay. can fly through. And that's why it's the book. No, absolutely, absolutely. And that's why it's so important to turn the lights out because that's when they're migrating at night when people light up the buildings. Uh, my name is Terry Wyrock. I live in Avon Lake. I happen to have the good fortune of living right across the street from a pair of bald eagles <laughs> in Avon Lake, uh, which was a great lucky thing to have happen to me. But I've been a member of this organization for about 20 years now, and you can't get a better bang for your dollar. They have great meetings uh, every month with super good speakers. There are a whole bunch of people that you can't find a, friend, a friendlier group, I don't think, in the world as birders. But uh, definitely they got that. They got a monthly newsletter. And a lot of people that know what birding is all about. And it doesn't matter whether you're new to birding or whether you've been in it for 20 years like myself. You're going to learn something that every meeting and every booklet you get in, in a great group. And besides that, at the end of their meeting, they have a great refreshment time. <laughs> a lot of good cakes and cookies and all kinds of stuff. Obviously. I highly recommend going with this group if, you, if you're at least partially interested in group. Well, thank you very much. And we, uh, we work very hard and make sure you give them a bag on the way out. <laughs> do you want to, Gina, do you want to grab a raffle? I have a dual purpose for being here today. I'm also a member of the EAAB, uh, the Environmental Affairs Advisory uh, Board at Avon Lake, whom our president, I think, is Sitty Lake over there right now. Yeah, the guy uh, that so it's a, it's a, a great organization, too, to help the people of Avon Lake as well as these people help the birds. This book that we're giving away is just one of, we have a, an online store and we sell a bunch of stuff on there. We make very little money and it's really just trying to get the stuff out to people so that they can, you know, give stuff to friends and family for gifts and people can learn stuff. But I just read this book and it's really, really fun. It's a super easy read. Lots of pretty pictures. So once you take a look at it, give it to somebody, pass it around. It's awesome. <laughs> and the winner is Megan Mitchell. Okay, anything else? Mr. Wyrock said it best. Um, I'm Sam from the Environmental Affairs Advisory Board. We just want to thank you for coming out tonight. Um, obviously, a great partnership with the Avon Lake Public Library. Um, we have been hosting these on a monthly basis, and we've seen a lot of engagement. We're excited by that engagement. Um, the topics were generated based on a survey that we can conducted in the fall of last year. Um, and so we hope to continue doing that type of research and bringing meaningful conversation to uh, the Evenly community. Um, if you're interested in getting engaged with us even more, the first Wednesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. we meet here at the library. Um, room TBD, so just check the schedule because we kind of bounce around based on what they have in the calendar. But um, it's a really great opportunity, great organization filled with amazing people like Terry Wyrock himself. Um, and so we'd love to see you there uh, next month. You said it was the what Wednesday? The first Wednesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. Yep. Okay, thank you so much for coming out.